I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting capitalallocatorspodcast.com. My guest on today's show is Tom Lydon, one of the leading experts in the ETF and mutual fund industries. Tom is the founder and CEO of ETF Trends, a business he created in 2004 whose website, etftrends.com, is filled with news, analysis, and webcasts about the world of ETFs. Before creating ETF Trends, Tom ran a financial advisory and publication business that followed the mutual fund industry. Our conversation covers the evolution of mutual funds in the 80s and 90s and the rise of ETFs in the 2000s. We discuss the composition of the ETF marketplace, structure and tax advantages of ETFs, passive, factor, and actively managed funds, characteristics of a superior manager, leveraged ETFs, the VIX blowup, potential future problems in high-yield and emerging market ETFs, and coming trends in the space. Please enjoy my conversation with Tom Lydon. Tom, thanks so much for joining me. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, we're going to talk a lot about a hot space, but as you know, I always love to figure out how someone got there. So why don't we just start with your early career and go from there? Yeah, well, I've got a few years on me, so I'll try to make it fast. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I grew up in the Boston area, went to Babson College, and out of school, I started Fidelity on the institutional side. I was lucky because my dad had been a broker in the 60s, so I knew what a mutual fund was. So rather than being in the bullpen, pen with most of the guys and girls, I got to be uh, in sales support for the institutional side. I supported the West Coast vice president, and back then the institutional side basically meant five regional managers. One of the benefits is we could actually take smaller accounts, and there was an investment newsletter company in Huntington Beach, California, that had 45,000 subscribers paying $275 a year to tell them when to buy and sell equity mutual funds based on basically a 200-day average. So this newsletter evolved out of moving your funds from a writing a note to the fund company to actually being able to call them on the phone and move from fund A to fund B. So that was a big revelation in the late 70s and the early 80s. And as you probably remember, newsletters were just through the roof, the magalogs in your mailbox and that type of thing. So heck of a lot of fun. But a bunch of people said, I, I'm not going to do this myself. Uh, I need somebody to do it for me. So hence, they started a money management company. And I went out to talk to them about it. And they said, geez, would you think about coming out and working with us. So it was one of those nasty Boston winters, and I could go and live in Huntington <laughs> Beach, not have to wear a suit, and basically swim in the ocean. How many year years round. were you at Fidelity before? A couple years. Leap. Okay. So again, I'm still really green. I learned a lot about the fund industry quick. It was actually right around the time 401ks were starting, so there was a lot going on. You know, the fund industry was in its heyday, kind of the way the ETF industry is right yeah. now. So, but it was fun. It was there was a heck of a lot going on. And my job there, in addition to the money management, was to communicate with the fund companies when there would be a general buy and sell. You can imagine having that many self-directed investors buying and selling at the same time, the phones would be pretty hot. And this was pre-platform, pre the Fidelities and, and the Schwabs, where you would go to one place to make all your trades. You'd actually have to make them with the fund companies themselves. So they would have Tons of people on the phone. The CEOs of these companies would get on the phone to help with the trading. And there would be a couple billion dollars that would be on a buy and a sell, which was revolutionary at the time. In those early days, what drove a buy or a sell of a mutual fund? So this was a technical trading plan, a simple moving average. This advisor used a, something short of a 200-day average, which you know historically works pretty well. Obviously, you can get some whipsaws, but if you can avoid some bear markets, that really helps. 
And this advisor actually had a sell signal on the Thursday before Black Monday in 1987. So, boy, that you know really put him on the map. But as a subscriber, you had to be paying attention. You had to make the call knowing that this trade was going to happen, number one, and then you had to execute. Not everybody did that. What did that do to the business at the time? Put it through the roof. So now you can say you've got this trade in place. You avoided the big decline. Moving averages, again— There are a bunch of firms that did a good job on that, were out before Black Monday. And really, we hadn't seen anything like that since 73 and 74. And then since then, it really was up until 2000 to 2003, which was the next time we had something sizable, right? So when you started, this is an investment advisor who's trading mutual funds based on a 200-day moving average. How much of what you did was just like operational, in getting people to make those trades. Okay, here's the moving average. There's a database. You're collecting yeah. the performance. No, that, that was it. And then selecting, making sure you're selecting the right funds. And what do the right funds mean? Basically, you wanted to make sure that it was highly correlated the, to the S&P 500, <laughs> but, and, right, number one. And number two, hopefully have some alpha. So you're picking good managers. So back then, the fund industry was – full of rock stars, you know, the Peter Lynch's, the John Neff's of the world, the John Templeton's, right? And you'd read about them on the cover of Money Magazine. You'd see them on Wall Street Week. It wasn't just making money, but you're backing a horse. And that's something I think, you know, with the ETF industry, we're missing today. Yeah. So you're in the mutual fund area, covering mutual funds, trading mutual funds in the 80s, in the 90s. That's a huge period of growth and change in the mutual fund industry. What were the key trends that you saw evolve? Yeah, well, it it got better because it went from you had to trade via sending a letter to the fund company to making a phone call to the evolution of the platforms. So then the Schwabs, the TDs, the Fidelities of the world said, look, we can make this a lot better for you. We can offer you a whole platform where you go to one place to make all your trades So the late 80s, early 90s was a huge growth area. And the fund companies didn't mind it because they would take all that work and then pay for it. Now, the costs involved in trading also declined at that point. I mean, trading early on in those days might have been 20 or 30 bucks. You know, it's down to less than nothing today. And then also the evolution of the no transaction fee platforms. So if you want to get on the platform and not charge the advisor or the individual investor, you'd have to pay a certain amount of basis points to the fidelity of the Schwabs of the world. That was a huge explosion in business for the, for those platforms and for advisors that were RIAs, fee-only advisors, because in, in the past they had to manage money directly with the fund companies. And so in those early days, what were the layers of costs in a mutual fund? Well, it was really expensive. It was quite often that you'd see expenses be, you know, 100 to 200 basis points. And then the internal trading. And then on top of that, if you're at a platform and you're not on a no transaction fee list, then the trading costs of the client, then you're playing, then the management fee as well. Disclosure wasn't as great as it is today. Boy, you know, over the past few decades, it's just continued to get better and better. Technology's improved tremendously. Being able to do batch trading and making sure that the efficiency of the trading's increased, that's been tremendous as well. What was a kind of an average active management fee back in, in for long only mutual fund in the, you know, 80s, early 90s? So it was average to see 150 basis points, but quite often you'd see hot managers that would be above 2%. And would they ratchet them up if the funds were popular? Sometimes, but also they'd have to control assets. So sometimes a bunch of money would come in at one point and they'd get scared, so they'd close them down. So there were little tricks that would happen in the industry, which would work in their advantage to a great degree. But what was funny is in the 90s, we had kind of a slow, steady upward movement in the marketplace. Those advisors that wanted to move in and out of funds actually would get handcuffed to some degree. If a fund company knew you were coming in and putting $20 million and then you were selling it six months later, they would actually work with the custodian. The custodian would say, they don't want that type of money, so you no longer can buy that fund, which worked very, very well for them through the 90s. But then what happened is in the early 2000s, we get a bear market. 
well, they're not going to be as picky as that. At that point, they're going to they're going to take all the money. But that was the period because ETF started in '93. They had a pretty slow buildup, but many of those active managers that had used mutual funds in the past now realized that there was this new tool out there, ETFs, where they were very liquid and they traded in a day and the spreads were getting tighter and there's more volume there. So they were saying, fine, we're going to begin shifting over there. By the end of the bear market in 2003, when these same fund managers and the salespeople were coming out and saying no, now they're knocking on the doors and saying, we're love to have you back and people are just waving at yeah, them. <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's, let's turn to ETFs. Everybody hears about ETFs. Some people think of them as synonymous with index funds, and there's certainly some index ETFs. Why don't you take me through just the evolution of where these things came from, how they were used, and we'll just go from there. So uh, 1993, Jim Ross, a good friend of mine at State Street and, and a crew, put together the first ETF, SPY, the S&P 500 ETF, merely as another way for liquidity for big clients that wanted instant exposure. That was the whole, they never believed it would really amount to anything, but as a big bank with large clients, it was something that through this new structure where they had a good legal team and early on, it was created. And it did exactly what it was supposed to do. It wasn't really marketed in any way, only to their clients, and then all of a sudden, others heard about it. Other companies began copying that model. The SEC had granted exemptive relief and others signed on for it as well. So it took three or four years to actually get some traction. But as we got into the early 2000s, all of a sudden, there's some major players and there's some decent money that's coming behind it. And as you point out, it's really index-based. Still, to this day, 95% of the ETF marketplace is index-based. Is that right? Yeah. And now... They're smart beta or factor strategies, but in fact, they are indexed with just different internal rules. So would you call that index or like systematic? There's some exposure. There's some defined exposure. Right. So up until 2007, 2008, most of it was pure cap-weighted indexes. And the low costs, the major market indexes that you would know, and then there was a battle about fees and got lower and lower. Then... As most of that cap-weighted index space got eaten up, you've got more players that came into the space and said, hey, factors are also important, whether it be volatility or momentum or value. So now there was a whole slew of those players that came in, introduced those options, and now multi-factors are also. So what we're doing is we're evolving kind of back to active management, still now in an index form. And... The cool thing about it is it's transparent. There's a discipline around it. There's no money managers that are making decisions in a black box. It's all open, and you can't violate the internal disciplines that are set up, or something would really pop to the surface, because the job is to follow the underlying index and have a very high correlation. If you don't, it's pretty notable. Let's just put some numbers on the landscape today. Total dollars in ETFs. So in U.S., $3.7 trillion, which just at the end of the financial crisis in 2009 was about $650 billion. So pretty good run, right? However, comparatively to the fund side, $14, 15000000000000 trillion there. I mean, we're chipping away at it, but you know, mutual funds aren't going away anytime soon. Right. And so of that $3.7 trillion, how much are the original cap-weighted index fund ETFs? Almost $2 trillion is in the top 100 ETFs. So right now, there are about 2,200 ETFs, and we're adding more every day. But the top 100 ETFs, $2 trillion, still pure beta strategies. Very few within that 100 happen to be outside or a little bit more sophisticated indexing. You know, you're going to have the the major equity indexes, the major fixed income indexes in there that have tens and in some cases, hundreds of billions of dollars like SPY, which is now $270 billion, right? And you said 95% is some type of index. So from 2 trillion to call it, I'll get the number wrong, but the next 1.1 trillion or so, those are 
smart beta smart factor beta. strategies right. that and, all follow a rule. And, okay. and smart beta is a huge net. We can get into single factor. We can get into multi-factor. And then some are a little bit more sophisticated. It's great to see all the ingenuity that comes out today. But, for example, we're in a rising rate environment. There's some strategies that might have a short treasury component and a long corporate and high yield component wrapped within that index. There's always this question, certainly with the index fund movement, of what's going to happen in a downturn. Or do the people who own these really understand? It sounds like the last big downturn we had really fostered the growth of these ETFs. Why do you think that happened? A couple things. I think with the amount of money that was in mutual funds, and a a big thing we compare to is mutual funds, most advisors and most individual investors felt that if you have a money manager who's had a pretty good run, that they're also going to do a pretty good job for you in the downside. Inevitably, we know that that's not the case. So did people lose a little bit of trust or a little bit of confidence in their managers? Maybe. Was cost involved? I think so as well. The whole transparency thing. So we've had a huge shift also in the advisory world from commission to just fee-only RIAs as well. And with all the economics that are going there as everybody's fighting for every dollar, a huge amount of advisors in the world have broken away from the wirehouse firms and the independent firms to set up their own shop. It makes sense for them just to, if they're going to do the whole thing, charge a flat fee, be completely transparent with their models. And a lot of them who have done that over the last nine years since the last bear market, it's paid off tremendously for them. They're making better money. Their clients have less fees. They're more tax efficient. And if you bought just a group of ETFs for your clients and done asset allocation, worked out great. So now your question, where do we go from here? Because... In the past, during that bear market, if you had a bunch of managers that were sitting on the bench behind you and a couple of them underperformed, well, you could always point to them and say, well, we're going to fire this guy and fire this guy and hire somebody else in. Well, now you look behind you, you have a bunch of indexes on the bench. It's all about you. You're naked on top of the mountain. So during the next bear market, if you don't have a plan in place, you can't point to the indexes you're going to have to take it on the chin yourself. And the question is, does the average advisor have a plan, number one? How is the average client going to react to that? And as far as self-directed investors who have invested in ETFs, maybe through robo-advisors and that type of thing, are they going to stick with it? They should. We know historically they should over time. Are they going to? Probably not, right? (laughs) What's the institutional presence in the ETF market? Is it something that you can quantify? It's growing. I would say ballpark might be the 400 to 500 billion area. Invesco PowerShares does a good job of surveying these folks on a regular basis. And a couple of things that I can share with you is the percentage or allocation that's gone into pure beta ETFs continues to increase. And really in the last couple of years, for the first time, they've started implementing smart beta strategies. A lot of institutions have. And my big question was, where did that money come from? Did it come from money they were taking away from hedge funds? Some, but they're actually shifting money from pure beta cap-weighted strategies as well. So th- that makes a heck of a lot of sense. What's happening with fees? So we know in the index side, all it's, it's a compression race to get to the lowest fee you can. And Vanguard obviously has a big presence in the ETF space as well. What happens with the smart beta strategies? Well, there's fee compression there, too. You can get a a smart beta strategy at Goldman for nine basis points. You have pure beta strategies now for four. A lot of folks in the industry think it's just going to go to zero because you can make a little bit on the spread, and securities lending is now playing a bigger role. So securities lending in some areas can be two to three basis points. And are you going to keep that yourself? Are you going to share with the shareholders? There's a big debate about that. But during bear markets, there's even more demand for securities lending. So that's something to kind of think about which might come into play in the future. How do these things get distributed? It's a great question because it's been very disruptive 
for the money management business. Much of the ETF industry came from the fund industry. And from a distribution standpoint, we all know it's all about wholesalers. It's about, all about relationships, taking somebody to dinner or taking them golfing or something like that. It's all a relationship business. Today, it's completely different. We do a study every year entitled How to Communicate with ETF-Centric Advisors, and we ask them not only how they want to be communicated with, but how do they get their research. Their number one research tool is Google. I want to look at an ETF that might do well in a rising rate environment, so I'm going to Google it. And a bunch of us, like us and other editors, research this and we write about it. It pops up on Google and or it might be on Yahoo, or it might be on Fox Business, or something like that. All of a sudden, we give three scenarios where we'll profile different ETFs that might do that. Advisors love it. They take it, they dig down deeper, and then they find out the best thing for them. They're not calling the ETF issuer. They're not even going to the website, because today, with all the research available, they can dig down themselves independently and find out what's going on. Yeah, very different. So what's happening is... The wholesaler route is becoming less and less. Internals are becoming more important. So if you have internal group that can maybe feed phone calls that come in or they can answer emails, but also help with other social medias becoming so much bigger. So in this evolution from pure index fund factors, you mentioned it, the next step is active management. Are you starting to see... Let's just start on the traditional long-only side, growth in long-only ETFs. So I feel it'll eventually come full circle, absolutely. And there are already some that have entered the space. Now, remember, one of the biggest tenets about the ETF space is transparency. So a lot of active managers who have noticed what's going on in the ETF space have held off entering because they don't want to disclose on a daily basis what they're buying and selling. Okay. Some mavericks have actually done so. Chris Davis, right down the street, Davis Advisors, three-generation company, great value managers, finally said, hey, you know, we're kind of transparent anyway. Don't trade very much either. They don't trade very much, no. And very high concentration in a few number of stocks. It was perfect for them. And you know what? Right out of the block in 2017, they launched some ETFs, were able to show some alpha versus their benchmark. All of a sudden, they're getting some traction. Exactly what should be happening. Good managers, and they're not, you know, 80% of active managers in the fund space underperform their benchmark. We know that. They don't have the tax efficiency. The fees are greater. You know, there's a big headwind running up against them. But if, if you've got something that's can differentiate yourself. The ETF space is fantastic. There's another group, ARC, which is down in the southern part of the island here. Kathy Wood, she was a Bernstein, very much in disruptive technology, robotics, automation, genome sequencing. We just did a webcast a couple days ago on genome sequencing, so they have their own ETF on that. Young analysts that are talking about it, hand-selecting stocks in an active way. There's an ETF around it. In a short period of time, they got $5 billion under management. Wow. So it's happening. It's happening. It's happening piece by piece. So you mentioned the tax efficiency. Part of the benefit of an index ETF is this sort of deferral of taxes, where you only pay taxes as if it's a stock. So part of it, and simply looking at it, when you build a basket, the baskets are swapped, not the individual Stock. So in most cases, when you look at high volume days on an exchange, and people talk about it, ETFs account for one third of the daily asset trading, right? Well, the baskets are trading, not the underlying. And that's where you get that. Walk me through that, like yeah. really simple building blocks. Yeah. So if you're creating an ETF, the underlying baskets or the constituents of that index are put into a basket. You've got market makers or authorized participants that do the trading between the buyers and the sellers. Because the underlying have really remained in place, there's not a taxable event. It's really that the baskets have been traded. And and with that in mind, the only time there really is a taxable event is when you're selling a basket And then it's no longer in the marketplace. A lot of times, too, as in these indexes, there's not a lot of changing within the index, too. The cool thing is with those active managers who have high concentration in individual stocks, 
they're really not doing that much trading either. So there's there's some added benefits. So is, does the tax effect come in when you trade a component of the basket? That's where it does come in. But the cool thing is you actually have the ability because you know, oh, here we have a taxable event over here. We can balance it out with something on the, on the sell side. And it really is simple for those that are at it on a regular basis. And it's amazing to see, even with over 2,000 ETFs that are out there, how very, very few have year-end distributions. So are there strategies like a concentrated active manager that make more sense in an ETF? Or do you think down the road, any active strategy could find their way into the structure? Well, that's a great question, Ted. I'll tell you right now, we've had such a good run on ETFs that the individual investors are thinking, I'm not buying mutual funds, I'm going to buy ETFs. And they're not really looking under the hood. It's just it's ETFs are cool and mutual funds maybe aren't as cool right now. People talk about ETFs on the golf course. You know, what type of ETF are you going to buy? This and that. It's almost like picking stocks at market highs. The key is it's a great wrapper for obviously indexing for sure. For active, it definitely can be. But the biggest thing is the transparency because there's a trust involved and there's a discipline involved, and especially for advisors and institutions, they don't want to be surprised. They've been at it before. They've seen it so many different times where you have a manager who may have high conviction, said he's got a discipline, ends up falling in love with a stock, and really can't justify it based on their model. So after following the mutual fund industry for a long time and mutual fund managers, and you now turn over and do both, but following ETF managers... Whether it's index or factor-based or active, what should somebody be looking at to determine if a manager is better than another one? So because we are in a situation where we're following indexes, the number one most important thing is making sure you're tracking your index. Awesome Net of thing. costs. Or, yeah. Exactly. And, and there's some that actually, okay, indexes are based on indexes that we have from the MSCIs and the S&Ps of the world, right? they will then license the index to different issuers. But it's the job of the ETF issuer to do the best job they can track in the index. So you think about all the S&P 500 indexes that are out there and ETFs that wrap around them. Not all of the issuers are as good at tracking that underlying. And that whole scenario will also play out in MSCI emerging markets and things like that. And now a lot of the self-indexing is happening. So they're trying to cut out the index providers where S&P might charge four or five basis points. And they say, I can really create my own index. It might be very similar in nature. I can't call it the S&P 500, but I'll call it this. And maybe there's a little alpha there. Or because I can shave off some of the expenses, I can actually do better. So there's a lot of shifting that's going around just to save a couple basis points. Is that good? Does that make a difference in the long term? Some might argue yes, some might argue no, but the way it's moved from our discussion from mutual funds and charging 200 basis points to now where it is today, pretty good deal for the end investor. I mean, they've really made out pretty well. So you mentioned a very concentrated industry structure, right, of two trillions in the hands of 100 funds. Is that market efficient? Meaning, if you just looked at the size of the fund for a particular strategy, is that highly correlated with the person who's doing the best job tracking the index? Very good. Very good question. I think the greatest thing here is we have competition. So even though it's kind of like the auto industry where you've got the big three, you know, you've got BlackRock, you've got Vanguard and State Street that really monopolize the ETF business. It's not as though we can't have competition. So now I think we've got this mid-tier of ETF issuers that are coming in, and they're saying, okay, I'm not going to battle in that pure beta space where you can charge five basis points. There's no money in that. Give it to the big guys. They can handle it all day long. I can come in and maybe through a factor strategy or a multi-factor strategy or maybe through self-indexing get a little bit of alpha there and even charge 20 basis points and make some money off it. But if I can get some alpha, then those that are investing in ETFs are going to give me a shot. It's been really tough to beat the S&P in the last nine years, right? 
So we're not really yet in a period where active management can really show its worth, but I think we're going to be getting there. And that's really going to get us more back to full circle where active managers are going to come in. They can show that maybe they're not going to give give back as much in market declines. They can find areas where they can add added alpha. And then also when you get into areas like technology, online, I mean, there's ProShares has this awesome ETF where it's actually short big box retailers and long internet providers, right? What a great concept, because I think you and I would probably think, yeah, that's something we need to do. Are we going to do it ourselves? No way. They go and do all the work for you, and you can go and buy that ETF. I think those concepts and themes are going to become more and more popular. What are some of the other ones that you love? There's also a EMQQ, which is a online retailer, but it's global. So we love, I mean, I use Uber all day long. I use Amazon all the time. I don't know who their counterparts are in India or in Brazil. This company goes in and picks those and who are the biggest players in those types of spaces, puts them together in an index in emerging markets and valuations collectively in that ETF are less than what the S&P 500 is. So what a bargain. Why would you, with the growth rates that you're seeing, why wouldn't you think about something like that? Yeah. So I want to turn to something that that I hate instead of something you loved, which are levered ETFs. Yeah. Do levered ETFs have a place to add value really for anything? The bottom line is they do exactly what they're supposed to do exactly on a daily basis. That's exactly what they sell. <laughs> right. And, and that's it. But for the average individual investor, it's dynamite. They're going to blow off a toe or something like that because it just ends up promoting bad behavior. However, there are institutions, there are advisors who do a really good job using them. And even though the asset growth in inverse and leverage ETFs haven't really kept up with overall asset growth in ETFs in general, it, it doesn't matter because when you look at the underlying volume, it's tripled. So more and more advisors and institutions are using them. Self-directed investors, there's some that are more sophisticated in using them. Again, when you get into the two and three times leverage, if you're not using them over a short period of time, that negative compounding effect really works against you. But, you know, on the other hand, if all of a sudden there's a huge valuation opportunity in gold miners and you see a, a huge sell-off in the market, 7 or 10% in a given day, and you say, hey, look, I think there's a swing opportunity here. I'm going to go in for two or three days. Rather than buying the individual issues or buying an actively managed gold miner mutual fund, that's something that you can watch inner day. And if inner day something happens, you can get out as opposed to the mutual fund itself. So I think you can always make the case for it. And then when you get into other areas that are a little bit more esoteric in the inverse and leverage space, you say, geez, you know, why in the world would you ever want to do that? The cool thing about ETFs, they're not going to bring them to market unless a group of people haven't come forward and said, hey, I really like to do this. Could you build it? So, so can I paraphrase what you, you said with strong bias, clearly, Yeah. in that the levered ETF only makes sense for someone who believes that they have a trade they want to make in a short-term market timing way. Absolutely. And if you're not short-term market timing something, you shouldn't touch these things. Correct. It is not a buy and hold position because it'll it'll just eat you up. All right. I just wanted to make that <laughs> yeah. on the yeah. air. I have my own bias against yeah. well, these things. Well, what do you think? But that's what fine. do you think? I wrote a paper about this like seven years ago. I think that most of the people that buy them don't understand that the rebalancing effect from day to day just eats you alive over time. Yeah. So you can, you know, you'd go through a 2008 and be 2x short and lose money if you held it for 4 or 5 months. And and I just think a lot of the people that I've seen buy these things don't understand that math. And and they feel deep down, I'm doing great cuz I'm short, and then they don't pay attention. They look at it for a couple of months, right? So it's like anything. A, you got to look under the hood, and B, if it's something like that, you have to look at it every day. You have to understand it. And I have to give these companies a little bit of credit because early on, maybe they didn't do as good enough job trying to educate. But if you look at, 
and I'm not just talking about disclosure stuff. I'm talking about white papers. You know, don't do this, don't do that. I think they're doing a, a, a decent job. But that negative compounding over time, it just can absolutely kill you. On the other hand, if you're a short-term trader, there's a huge opportunities there and a lot of different yeah. choices. Yeah, I, I just feel like in, in a capital markets world where everyone is always complaining about everyone being too short-term, this is like the worst of the worst, right? But that's fine. Let's talk about landmines. So we just saw this VIX ETF, which is a similar dynamic, right? Highly levered, probably the people who owned it or were shorted or whatever didn't really understand it, but highly levered vehicle. You have a move that was different from the pattern over the last year up in the VIX, and the next thing you know, the ETF blows up. What's waiting? So what's going to come after that? Well, yeah, or, what's, or what's what happened? Yeah. Well, why don't, why don't we go a little bit through what happened? Now, I think I think people who care probably understand it at this point. But why don't you talk a little bit about what happened? I'm really more curious about like what are the what's waiting in the wings for the next problem like this. So, and I think it's a great case study. And I actually am one of those knuckleheads that actually went in and bought that thing in the final hour. And it was it was crazy because in fact, so to set the case, we're at February 5th, the market's declining. The VIX went from like 20 to 40 in a very short period of time. A lot of people felt that, you know, overnight markets will settle. We'll probably get some type of rebound tomorrow. And this instrument was a... Inverse VIX. So you basically... It short. It short the VIX. So as you saw the VIX double in a certain day on the upside, you're thinking, hmm, probably going to settle tomorrow. So I'm going to go in and buy some of that. And then if it does settle and the... VIX moves from 40 back to 20, I got a chance to, to make some money pretty quick, right? And everybody who had the same brilliant idea that I did, they were absolutely right because that did in fact happen. The next day, the market came back, the VIX settled. However, one important component was the settlement of the ETN, which was the Credit Suisse XIV. Now, the ETN's a little bit different. You have an underlying bank, and it really is a debt instrument. Their only obligation is really at the end of the day to settle the trades. Throughout the course of the day, even though money was coming in, and there's estimates that almost a billion dollars had come into the space in the last few hours, they had no obligation to do any buying into the market until after the close. And you can actually settle up until 415. So can you imagine in the futures market, Going in and having to buy futures and a billion dollars worth, it just was a shit show. It, it was crazy. So the more they bought, the more they got away. And so let's walk through this really slowly to make sure I understand it. So you're at you're at three fifty nine. The VIX is at forty. Mm-hmm. This short VIX product has a billion dollars of orders to sell that VIX, but they haven't executed it yet. No. So what do they do? So they go in at, at the close, and now no more trades are coming in, right? Because the ETNs, there are no more trades to buy. To buy, right? They've but they got, still have a billion to sell. They've, they've got to sell, right? And the more they buy, the more it affected the price. And then on top of that, you had a couple other VIX ETFs that were actually having to go and do the same thing. Not to that extent. And once it's all settled in a 15-minute period of time, and you can imagine what that looked like if you're on a desk, right? Then all of a sudden, in 15 minutes, 95% of the value declined. The ETF itself was trading at about $98 at the close, and it opened up at about 6 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> this begs the question of, are there other problems waiting to happen. And usually it's not the same type of problem. But where are the risks in the ETF space today? So my radar's up all the time because we're huge fans of ETFs and I feel obligated to the advisors and individuals that we try to educate on a regular basis, try to expose great opportunities at the same time, where are the risks? One area that pops up is fixed income. People say, hey, we got a lot of money here. There's going to be a problem when there's a, a sell-off in the bond marketplace. It's all going to be on the ETF market. Okay, so a couple things. First of all, there's about $700 billion in fixed income-related ETFs. There's probably $4 trillion in fixed income mutual funds. Okay. So just to kind of put things in perspective, if there's going to be a sell-off in funds, ETFs, 
they're going to be a lot more funds that are being sold than ETFs. Okay, number one. Number two, there are a lot of people who are trading bonds on a regular basis that said ETFs are the best thing that happened to the marketplace as far as price discovery. Price discovery in stocks is pretty easy. It, it, there's a high level of confidence. On the fixed income side, still kind of a little loose, but actually because there's more liquidity in the ETF space, we've seen better price discovery because ETFs have come into the marketplace. And part of that is because even though funds have been around for a longer period of time, there's not as much trading. It tends to be more trading in fixed income related ETFs and especially those underlying that are tied to those indexes. And when you hear about it, you really hear this notion of this sort of liquidity mismatch. You hear mostly about high yield bonds and maybe emerging market high yield or emerging sovereign bonds. How does it reconcile that you have underlying instruments that are just not as liquid as the vehicle itself? Part of that is most of the indexes and most of, so we're going to talk a little bit about active fixed income maybe in a minute, but most of the traditional index-based strategies and tools that are out there in the ETF space have very liquid underlying, and they do a good job in making sure that happened. Okay, now, there was an exception. 2015 had a little bit of a sell-off in the muni market. A lot of people can remember that. What was interesting is funds were being sold, individual issues were being sold, ETFs were being sold. And for the first time, and we hadn't seen this happen before, some redemptions were actually met in kind. So rather than getting the cash, you actually got the bonds themselves. Kind of cool because funds have always had that in the prospectus. They can redeem in kind, and that's going to deter trading to some degree. But some of these desks, these authorized participants, didn't get the cash. They actually got the bonds themselves. And this was just a short period of time. But this is one way that we can, I think, have confidence that there will be liquidity. Okay. And and so those are trading desks. That's not mom and pop getting sent a whole bunch of muni bonds. Correct. Okay. How about pricing distortions? So with more and more money coming into these ETF index funds, particularly in some, not the SPY, but in an emerging market bond index or something, mm-hmm. you hear about if the particular bond is in the index – that price can get marked quite differently from a similar bond that's outside the index. How does the ETF ecosystem think about that? Well, first of all, and, you know, emerging markets have, as you know, they've come a long way in the last 10 years. And these countries, they want participation. They want money. So their accounting methods have stepped up. Their technology has stepped up. And then the issuers that are putting these underlying indexes together are testing them to make sure the liquidity is in place. Is that always going to hold? Who knows? Is there exposure there? Maybe there is. Is there a chance that at one point in time we're going to see an underlying bank and an emerging market fail where that's going to affect the pricing? Probably, and that's the way the markets work. Today, would you stay away from emerging market bond ETF because of the possibilities there? Man, the yields are great. The valuations are awesome. And I, I still can't believe in talking to advisors when we talk about the opportunities in emerging markets, for example, both on the bond side and and then the equity side, the, with the valuations, the diversifications in mind, somebody like a Rob Arnott that I talk to on a regular basis who personally has 50% of his individual money in emerging markets and said, you just don't see valuations like this with P ratios around 12 right now. I think you're going to see it's the normal markets, it's the ebbs and flows. And the cool thing about it is Emerging markets have really stepped up, and more of these developing markets see the opportunities to get more of U.S. money. I think it's going to continue to improve, but we're always going to see those anomalies where some underlying is going to go under or be affected. Is that ETF and that index diversified enough? Will it really smart and hurt bad? Will it put a bruise on the industry? Don't know. Yeah. And what happens in these rule-based systems, particularly in kind of the high-yield issues, in a higher default rate environment? It's not tested yet. We just haven't seen it. So really, it was a drop in the bucket in assets that we had very few fixed income offerings back in 
uh, 07 through 09, but there were some, and they were notably affected. If we go through another period of time like that with that much more money in the ETF space, will it happen? But, you know, it's a different world. I mean, the banks are that much more secure today. So I'm with you. I think, hey, we always want to look out and see where those potential landmines What I really like about the fixed income space is there's more choice. So there's so many asset classes now in fixed income via ETFs. The Barclays Ag is not the Barclays Ag that it was at the end of the financial crisis, right? So the credit rating is a lot less today than it was back then, number one. Duration is doubled since that period of time. We're now in a situation where institutions and advisors still are tracking the Barclays Ag, and many don't realize those important aspects. We know that treasuries in a rising rate environment get whacked pretty hard. So why, if you've got all the tools to kind of construct your own index, why aren't you not necessarily buying treasuries, but buying the corporates, buying bank loans, buying foreign bonds to kind of create your own index? And some advisors and institutions are, in fact, doing that and using ETFs as as the tools to do that. So similar to what we talked about in the equity world, then the fixed income world does have this, whether you call them factors or they're different types of security ETFs. And you mentioned active fixed income. What's happening there? So the great thing is the Bill Grosses and the Jeff Gunlocks of the world have found a home in the, in the ETF space. We've seen the, the beginning stages of rising rates. We've seen active managers like Gross and, and Gunlock, and now we've got some rock stars in the ETF space. Well, say, <laughs> back, back to what it was. <laughs> right, right. So the key is, can they outperform the indexes? They think they can, and they've actually had some periods of time of outperformance. Will we see that continue? Uh, you know, I, I think so to a great degree. And I think we'll also see ETF issuers start to promote and educate more about spreading outside the major market indexes. I mean, you, you look at Gunlock, he's got a great portfolio, but he's got over 50% in mortgage backed securities, right? Now, that wouldn't have worked back in the financial crisis, but he's okay with doing it right now, right? And as long as people trust your active manager, great. Will he be there and be able to protect you in the next downside? Yeah. I love the fact that there's more active coming to the space, but we will as we t- point out, eventually go get full circle because those advisors want to have the guys like Gunlock and Gross on their the bench. The rock star right? guys, yeah. yeah. Do you think that fund flows will chase hot managers and create future rock stars? I think it will. I, I think it, we will see chasing hot managers. I would say robotics, for example. There's a Robo Global that had been around for five years, hung under $100 million dollars. And then all of a sudden, people got it, and now they're at $3 billion, you know, in, an, in another year. That's not going away. I think we're going to see that in the technology space. And we saw this in the technology space in the 90s. Remember the hot fund managers that were out there? They built fund companies all around different technology spins, huge amount of money, and then poof, it went, it went away. But it's not 1999 today. Valuations seem to be very much in line. Yeah. So what are the big trends? If we look out, call it five years, maybe even 10 years in the space, what are we going to see that's different from what we see today? I think a couple things. First of all, ETF strategists are a whole ecosystem unto themselves. They are, in fact, advisors who manage money for their own clients and created portfolios of ETFs with specific strategies in mind. They've made them available to other advisors and to individual investors, and now they're popping up on platforms all over the place. So if you're a fan of ETFs and you want a specific strategy and you don't want to have to make all the calls yourself, you can actually now see published returns that go back, you know, five and ten years with some of these folks. Most because of this bull market in stocks and the bull market in bonds, People haven't needed that. I think they will need that in the future because you're going to need people to help guide you through the trends, the ups and the downs. So I I think we'll see that. The ETF issuers are, in fact, creating their own portfolios as well, not only using their own ETFs, but using their competitors' ETFs, 
within portfolios, and they'll make them available too. So that's kind of the next wave of kind of portfolio management in the in the ETF space. What do you think happens with liquid alternatives? There are a lot of choices right now, which is fantastic, except there's not a burning desire for them. What tends to happen, and, and Ted, you know, people always buy it after they already needed it, right? So right now, rising rate environment, we've been talking about it for five years. Are we finally starting to feel the pain? Maybe. So there are definitely alternative strategies in that space that I think can do very well. On the equity side as well, long, short, we'll probably have a period of time in the next three to five years where it might be able to show some alpha. Fantastic. Commodities. They've been on love for an extended period of time. And there are a lot of choices in that space that you can slice up even agriculture. They'll have wheat, they'll have corn ETFs. So all the choices are there. You know, you're like a kid in a candy store if you're looking for alternatives or or commodities and all those different choices, but they really haven't accumulated a lot of assets up until this point. Eventually, just like the fund industry, when something's hot, all the money will flow in. But you can't say that you didn't have, you didn't have choices there. Yeah. What are the businesses that have really thrived and will in this space? So we, you've mentioned the big index providers. So we know that those are big businesses, and we know that that's concentrated. But you have all these products that probably aren't that big. So as you look at that whole ecosystem of fund management providers, you've mentioned strategists, advisors. Where do people who think that ETFs are going to continue to grow and explode over the next 10 years, how do people plug into that and provide value to their clients, and who's, who are going to be the winners in terms of the business? Yeah, so like you said, obviously the issuers, and there's more competition within that space. We're seeing a lot of M&A going on in the space already. There are a lot of managers who were late to the game, and rather than create it themselves, they'd want to go in and buy somebody. So it's hot right now, and managers are paying premium prices for established ETF shops, even if it's small. So look out for that. The platforms, the Schwabs, the Fidelities, the TDs of the world, where they made a ton of money in the past in their mutual fund platforms, they now have no transaction fee ETF platform. So you can buy and sell ETFs through Schwab for no fee, and that's subsidized by the relationship with the ETF issuer. So they're paying to be able to have that, which is great. I mean, I can remember meeting Chuck Schwab's manager, one of his is money managers in San Francisco. And he told me the story about explaining ETFs to Chuck. Now, ETFs were very disruptive to Schwab because Schwab had this mutual fund platform where they were making a killing. And when Chuck came back, he sat everybody down and said, hey, we need to pay attention because this is what we're all about. It's tax efficiency, it's diversification, it's liquidity, it's low fees, we need to embrace that. It's going to be painful. And they did it, and they've, they've just done a great job. So I, I think that's a, another area that we need to research. So it's amazing how everybody is looking for research and so for guidelines and ideas in ETFs. The media is playing a big part of it. What you're doing with podcasts, what we're doing with social media as far as discussion, videos. And it's not just like modern media like CNBC and Fox, but you're seeing advisors pop up on YouTube all the time talking about different strategies, you know, via Seeking Alpha. So there's just a huge amount of resources that are available. And advisors are finding those resources that they like the best themselves. Yeah. So I want to turn to some closing questions. But before that, I'm just curious what your business is. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know all this stuff. you followed it. But why don't you tell me a little bit about ETF trends and, and what you do so people who are interested can plug into that. Yeah. So it all came out of our advisory business. We began shifting from mutual funds to ETFs in the early 2000s. People are saying, well, what, what's an ETF? We developed ETF trends with the idea that just to educate clients and, and prospects – And then all of a sudden, the more we wrote, the more people showed up. ETF issuers started coming to us and saying, can we advertise on your site? And we woke up one day in the publishing business. Okay. (laughs) So this was 2005, right? So a long time ago, we're thankful to be ahead of the curve. 
Since then, we've really taken it on to be one of the leading educators for financial advisors and institutions on ETF strategy. So we do that not only through our content, but we do it through webcasts. We do more webcasts on ETFs than anybody in the world. We do virtual conferences. We'll have 3,000 advisors show up for a five-hour virtual conference. So a lot of fun there because, again, when you look at the average advisor that's embraced ETFs, it's not the one that's still stuck in mutual fund land. It's the one that has younger people, embrace technology, thinking about growth, thinking about risk. It's the new wave, and we want to communicate them with them that way. So we've, even though I'm old, I'm trying to embrace social and get some young people in there to keep all that stuff going. We do a lot of videos. I've written a couple books. Um, Geez, I don't know if I have the guts to enter the podcast world, but I'm really envious of everything that you've done. <laughs> All right, here we go. Some closing questions. Tom, what was your favorite sports moment? So I think I mentioned I grew up in the Boston area, and most people in Boston have had some pain over the years. But in 04, when the Sox, I know, I realize I'm on Yankee territory you right are. here. You <laughs> are. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> but in the story is this. It was not just great for the win. And New England Sports Network did a a documentary on what it meant to families and for generations. So when I grew up, my grandfather died when I was four. My grandmother moved back in with two of her sisters that never got married into the house that they were born in. And when we were over there during baseball season, the TVs would be on, the radios would be on, and there were just huge Red Sox fans, okay? They lived into their 90s, and they weren't around in 2004 to see that, right? Those of us who are Red Sox fans look back on those times that we were with our loved ones who were no longer around, and it really meant something. I had my three kids sign contracts on the day that they were born to be Red Sox fans <laughs> and to be with my, my oldest son who was nine and, and jump up and give high five. It was kind of cool. Yeah, that's great. What's your biggest investment pet peeve? I feel strongly about this because I think all the good things that ETFs have to offer, they've fallen short in making their way into defined contribution plans or 401k plans. They're available to some degree, but just to give you an example, out of every dollar that goes into Fidelity mutual funds, 75% go in via 401k plans. Which are still in the traditional mutual funds, you say. Right. Yeah. And part of it is, I mean, I, I feel like if we can put a man in the moon in 1968, we can figure out a way to find ETFs in the 401k plans because that change in expenses from 10 basis points to 80 basis points is just huge. It means a lot to individuals. And, I, you know, I talk to young people all the time. I encourage them to participate in the 401ks but most importantly, allocate the right way. And I just think we could do a better job. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? My mom and dad are some of the nicest people in the world. And one thing that they always do uh, when they see people is they look them in the eye, they shake their hand, and they always remember their names, and they always remember something about them. And these are qualities that they've taught my brother and sister and I, and I don't do it enough. We really try to teach our kids this, but it's just basic kindness. But remembering names, and I'm I cha- I'm challenged with that. I was going to ask: is, <laughs> is there like a is there like a mnemonic device that you use to help you remember? They just make it a priority. And boy, you know, I I think tom- sometimes in business, we're fortunate to meet a lot of people, and we're at conferences, and you know, I stumble sometimes. But I look at them and still they're in their 80s and they're in great shape, you know, knock on wood. And it's just really great to see that they continue to do this. And we've learned from that and my kids learned from that. And I just think that that, forget about the business aspect of it, just the human nature of it. It it really means something. That's great. What information do you read that you get a lot out of that other people might not know about? And this this could be an interesting one for you. (laughs) Yeah. So some of the... The liquidity providers in the ETF space, the Susquehannas, the Wallach Beths of the world, the Cantor Fitzgeralds, do a good job in giving a daily tally of what's gone on in the marketplace relating to ETFs. And if by chance you're interested in ETFs and you can get on those lists, 
they're really telling because they go through the market in one page and kind of talk about what's been going on. So I love that. But actually, more importantly, and it, it's kind of related, it's back to this podcast thing. I've become like a podcast freak. That's <laughs> only so, one you really need to listen to. <laughs> right, right, right. But I like on the weekends going down to the beach and I walk for maybe two or three hours. I listen to you. I listen to Meb Favor. I listen to Patrick O'Shaughnessy. And a handful of you guys really get it right. And it may be not just the investment aspect, but you're, you're finding out about people and real people. And I think that means something. And now I'm taking it to I'm on the plane or I'm, or I'm driving in a car. I'm reading all day long. We're at our computers. We got all the screens going all day. It's kind of my personal time. And I really, really enjoy it. So congratulations to you and everything that you're oh, doing, thanks. Ted. What difficult decision have you made that you feel great about today? I think starting my own business. And, you know, there are a lot of people that just have a tough time making that move. So I would just encourage folks today because things are changing so fast. Technology is changing so fast. Time goes by really quickly. You know, and I used to be in this business, the young guy that could stay out till midnight and, you know, at the conferences and this and that. I just can't do it these days. And when I sit around people and inevitably I'm, I'm at 58, the oldest by far, you can't get that time back. So I would just say, look, if you're thinking about something and you have conviction, go for it. All right, last one. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in your life? I think it's somewhat similar to the last one, which is you need to take risks. And I really encourage people to take risks. The best thing you can do is take a risk and fail because that's the, the fear of failure is the number one thing that holds people back. And early on, we're all conditioned. We've got to go to school. We've got to get good grades. You, you know, you play some sports. You're, you're a good participant in the family. You need to have a well-thought-out career. My first job out of school was working for Richardson Vicks, selling cough drops and NyQuil and oil of Olay. I took it because I had it. I got the job in February of my senior year at school. It was 1982, and we were coming out of recession, and I was really lucky to get the job. It paid well. I got a car. I got an expense report. My first area was Westchester County, Queens, and Harlem. Not that bad, but I got a promotion to handle North and South Dakota, Western Wisconsin, and the state of Minnesota, selling cough drops. Not that difficult. And after three months, I called my dad and I said, I'm not doing anything. He said, you got a good degree. Wrap it up and come home if you want to. And that's what I did, and I landed at Fidelity, or I'd still be selling cough drops if I didn't take the risk. (laughs) Tom, this is great. Thanks so much. I enjoyed it, Ted. Thank you. Hey, before you take off, I've started sending out a monthly email that shares a small selection of what caught my eye over the month. I get a lot of emails like this, and I'm sure you do too, so I'm only going to send no more than a handful of the very best things that caught my eye. If you'd like to receive that email, hop on my website at capitalallocatorspodcast.com and join the mailing list.